Uh, tonight, we're addressing uh, the question of how to handle and record uh, investment club fees, investment club expenses, investing expenses uh, with, with respect to changes in the tax law and uh, the proper ways to record these in your books. So let's start at the very beginning and talk about uh, the, some uh, vocabulary. Uh, we talk about member payments, and that is the category uh, that you might know as dues. Payments are, are paid in by members on a monthly or other regular basis. Uh, payments are used to buy units in in your investment club. And then members may also contribute money known as fees. Fees are paid by members that do not buy units in the investment club. So there may be situations where you would use fees or, and situations where you would use payments. Um, together, the payments and fees that your members uh, contribute to your club are included in their total paid in plus earnings. That's known as the, the PIPE or the P-I-P-E. Uh, also included in PIPE is the member share of earnings that's been allocated to them annually. Uh, so the, uh, the total uh, at year end of the member's total contributions to the club uh, reflect both payments and fees. It's just that fees do not buy units. So let's talk first about why and when you should be using fees. And our recommendation is that you use fees only for penalty type situations, such as late fees, if you charge those, or if a member bounces a check, um, they would write a, a check to cover that, uh, that uh, bounce check fee uh, that the club was charged, uh, and that would be charged as a fee to the member. Um, and those are really about the only times we believe that fees should be used. And in fact, uh, we don't even believe that late fees should be collected from members. A lot of um, clubs do stipulate that if you are late paying your monthly dues, that you uh, are levied a fee. Uh, again, the intention is to force members to be active, to force members to, to participate, uh, to provide uh, a steady growth of the club's capital uh, with which they can invest uh, in equities. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, uh, collecting and recording fees really makes the club treasurer's job harder. Uh, this is another category of uh, of member contributions that have to be recorded. Often the treasurer is tasked with tracking down uh, the member fees uh, for members who are late or who, who uh, miss a meeting. Uh, so it just makes things much more complicated for the treasurer. Um, and we like to keep the treasurer's job easy. If anybody in your club objects to making the treasurer's job easier, then they should be first on the list for uh, the, the position at the next time your club has an election. Uh, but another reason is that members who miss their monthly payments or who are late are really only hurting themselves in the long run, especially as the club, uh, the club is going to grow and the unit value is moving upwards. Uh, then members who are late uh, are missing the opportunity to buy those units at that lower amount. Uh, and so that is penalty enough uh, in my view. So uh, those that leaves uh, s situations such as a bounced check fee uh, that a member is reimbursing the club for. It's just about the only time that we recommend that you use uh, the fee type of member uh, contributions. Um, and again, if you're worried about uh, members making monthly contributions to the club, well, there are other ways that you can handle it. Um, of course, they could set up, uh, your club could set up electronic deposit or e-payments or uh, ACH payments that uh, transfer money automatically to the club's bank or brokerage account from the member's account. Uh, there could also be uh, many banks offer free bill pay where they will send a paper check uh, and that could be delivered to the club's treasurer on a monthly automated schedule uh, and that uh, just means instead of bringing the check to the club meeting uh, the checks arrive at the treasurer's house uh, sometime before the meeting uh, and the treasurer uh, would just have to collect those checks um, another 
option is that you could allow members to prepay their dues, uh, either on a quarterly or an annual annual basis. I've heard of clubs uh, that utilize most both of those methods. Uh, many large clubs, especially uh, where uh, they uh, are not necessarily buying and selling on a more frequent basis, but managing a portfolio, they may um, uh, kind of reduce, don't see the need to have a monthly meeting uh, and may meet quarterly, uh, or they may uh, require a single payment at the beginning of the year that covers the whole year, and then they figure out how to invest as they go, and they're selling, so they're also raising capital that way to invest in new securities. Uh, so uh, yes, it can be beneficial to invest on a monthly basis, but that's not necessarily the only way. Uh, for members who are prepaying quarterly, uh, it is possible for the the treasurer to set that up uh, in using suspense accounts and actually record the monthly, uh, the you know, sort of transfer the money uh, from one account, the suspense account, to the brokerage account or bank account on a monthly basis um, uh, to accommodate the club's monthly schedule if they wish, uh, but it isn't necessarily uh, the only way that you can do it. I, I have also heard of clubs where every January, every club member is expected to deliver 12 signed uh, po post-dated checks to the treasurer, one for each month. Uh, the treasurer at the beginning of the year simply gets 12, 11 envelopes uh, or 12 envelopes and uh, puts uh, each member's check into the appropriate uh, monthly envelope and then uh, at that, uh, month after that monthly meeting uh, or just prior to it would make that deposit for the month and that way everyone always pays every month on time and uh, uh, again that's uh, another method uh, that many clubs have found to be successful so uh, if you're really worried about members paying on a monthly basis um, and paying on a regular basis, uh, those are some alternatives. But again, in the bigger scheme of things, if someone misses a meeting and they come in the next meeting and they, they pay double, uh, you know, they pay, make a double payment, yeah, that should be fine. Uh, in the long term, it's all going to even out and uh, you don't need to sweat it too much. Uh, often newer clubs, try to be rigorous, try to set these structures in place, and uh, it just makes things more complicated. So what should fees not be used for? And most, our, our recommendation is that fees should not be collected from members to cover club expenses. Uh, the club will legitimately have uh, investment expenses and operating expenses. They'll have their, their club accounting software, tax preparation software, better investing membership. Uh, they may have uh, cost of postage or uh, cost of making copies. Uh, so there are some legitimate uh, expenses that a club might wish uh, to incur. Uh, and that's perfectly fine to have those expenses be paid out of the club's bank account, uh, just out of the cash on hand, out of the pool of money that the club has collected uh, to use for investment purposes as well as operating purposes. Uh, and so uh, that uh, should be fine. Um, and clubs should should not feel like we need they need to create a separate pool of money to cover expenses. Some clubs uh, prefer to do that. Uh, again, it is okay if that's what you want to do, but it tends to make things more complicated. Uh, and again, complicated is not good. If you want to collect additional money from members, uh, to cover expenses, just ask them to contribute an extra $50, in, you know, for instance, in a particular month, uh, and then use that money uh, recorded as a member payment. In other words, it, pay, it purchases units. Um, but at the end of the day, whether you collect additional money for expenses or you don't, um, it's not going to have a big impact on your bottom line. Uh, money is still coming in and the money is still going out. And so uh, calling it uh, uh, um, an expense and a fee and a member due or member contributions or member fees, uh, th these are all uh, terms that don't really have a big impact on, uh, on uh, the 
the bottom line of your investment club, which is, are you able to be successfully invested in the stock market? But uh, we recommend that you don't try to collect fees to cover club expenses. We'll talk more about this later because you can get into trouble uh, in some ways when you try to record uh, fees and expenses simultaneously. We'll cover that. But I wanted to talk about investment expenses next. Now, prior to 2000, the 2017 tax year, um, uh, there were two categories of expenses in our My iClub and Club Accounting 3 program. The first was deductible expenses. Uh, this was for uh, uh, legitimate expenses related to investment and club operations, such as software for club accounting, tax preparation, postage copies, membership, subscriptions, etc. cetera. Uh, there was another category of expenses known as non-deductible expenses. Uh, these included uh, flowers, for instance, if you sent them to a member who was in the hospital, uh, snacks or meals at club meetings, uh, other gifts, other items that were not considered valid, quote, investment expenses by the IRS. The IRS had a publication, Publication 550, that detailed all of the allowable investment expenses. And then these expenses were reported by the club accounting software on each member's IRS schedule K-1s so that members who itemized could potentially make use of the federal deduction for investment expenses. Um, and so uh, the idea is that if you're incurring the certain types of expenses, uh, with regard to your investment portfolio, that those some portion of those expenses uh, could be deducted from your federal tax return. However, uh, what often got glossed over is that most individuals were not able to deduct any investment expenses since the that miscellaneous items deduction was limited to only the amount that exceeded 2% of the taxpayer's adjusted gross income or AGI. So uh, imagine if you had uh, $100,000 of adjusted gross, gross income, only the expenses that exceeded $2,000, uh, the first 2,000 was non-deductible. Anything after that was deductible. And that would be a phenomenal amount of expenses to have incurred. Uh, so even within an investment club and a, the management of a personal portfolio, uh, it's hard to see where uh, many investors would be at the level where their investment expenses uh, were deductible. However, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017 eliminated investment expenses from the miscellaneous itemized deduction. So individuals uh, beginning in that tax year could no longer deduct investment expenses from their federal tax return. So as a result, the category of deductible and the category of non-deductible expenses were both one and the same. It, they were simply expenses. Now we chose not to change the My iClub software uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that uh, we still need to report expenses. Uh, some professional type investment partnerships uh, may uh, uh, need to reveal those, those legitimate investment expenses as business expenses uh, to their partners. Most of the Better Investing Style Investment Clubs, that's not going to be applicable to. Uh, but uh, we're still reporting out those partnership expenses on the K-1s that we generate, even though when your individual members get those K-1s, they are not going to be able to, there's no place on the uh, the current uh, individual tax forms for their, them to, for you to put in your share of the club investment expenses. So uh, for that reason, um, it's even uh, uh, it complicates things a little bit. Uh, we are going to maintain that uh, investment uh, invest category categories, uh, deductible and non-deductible. Um, I think this helps us focus, helps the members focus on um, the you know the legitimate expenses that go into running an investment club, uh, which are pretty unavoidable, uh, and then the optional investments, which are nice, but uh, uh, optional expenses, which are nice but are not necessarily um, uh, uh, required in order to build the club's portfolio. Um, on the federal 
and tax returns, uh, we still report out expenses when those uh, agencies report, re uh, uh, require uh, that reporting. And you never know what's going to happen in the future. And it's it conceivable, not within, uh, not outside the realm of possibility, that tax laws could change again at some point. Um, so for now, we are maintaining those uh, those types of expenses. Now, when uh, the treasurer is recording uh, the investment club expenses, our rec there are two options. One is to allocate, allocate expenses by ownership, and the second option is to allocate expenses equally by member. So if you have a $100 expense and you have 10 members, uh, that equal allocation would charge each member $10 of that $100 expense. If you allocated uh, by uh, percentage ownership, then the 17% member would get $17 of the expense, and the 2% member would have 2% uh, of the expense. Uh, and so our recommendation, however, is always use the allocate by percentage ownership option for investment expenses. Uh, and the reason for that is this is the same way that you handle the earnings of your partnership. Uh, would uh, anyone in your club be happy, or, or do you think that the majority would agree to allocate uh, uh, the club's earnings equally, no matter how much you invested in the club? Uh, no, that would never happen. Uh, the, the member who owns 17% of the club wants 17% of the club's gains and profits. Um, so it's only fair that they pay 17% um, of the expenses. And in fact, the IRS uh, specifically states that this is the method the partnerships must use. Uh, and if they don't use this method, if they don't allocate um, uh, expenses by percentage ownership, then it should be in their partnership agreement and thus signed and agreed by all members. Uh, and even if you don't use it exclusively, if you are using the by member, um, by member type allocation uh, or by member allocation of investment expenses, um, you need to go back to your partnership agreement and redo it and make sure that it includes that provision. Um, and I, I'm a stickler on this because a disgruntled member uh, who leaves your club and it, uh, ha may have grounds to come back to the club and say, uh, you know, the partnership agreement didn't say that I uh, didn't say that I would be charged this way. The IRS says uh, that um, I'm supposed to have been charged by uh, by. Uh, by my ownership, uh, and so I think the club was pulling a fast one on me, uh, and so uh, that's one of the areas where partner in partnership law, as I understand it, where general partners of a partnership uh, do have recourse. So that's why I hammer home this point as frequently as I can, because I don't want your uh, a past member to leave the club unhappily and then figure out that the club was doing something uh, that, was, that, that wasn't disclosed properly in the partnership agreement. Um, if we think about investment expenses and to justify why I believe they should be allocated by ownership, investment expenses that are incurred by the partnership ben should benefit the entire partnership. They shouldn't benefit only a few partners. Uh, and if you are a large owner uh, within a partnership, you've got a, a high ownership part, uh, percentage relative to other partners, it's in your interest to have a strong partnership, to have partners who are informed, uh, knowledgeable, um, who are gaining experience because they're going to help make decisions that affect your large ownership share. So it, it, it behooves you in that case to support uh, with uh, you, you know the higher expenses that are going to be incurred on your behalf, the education and uh, uh, enlightenment of the other members of the partnership. Uh, and if you believe that this is not the case for certain types of expenses, then uh, perhaps the club needs to figure out uh, if that expense is truly warranted and if it's worth uh, the incurring uh, by, on behalf of the club. Now, that recommendation often 
causes some consternation amongst investment clubs, particularly uh, as it relates to better investing membership. Better investing membership, uh, it, the club membership has a base rate and then every member um, has a rate on top of that uh, to be part of the organization. Uh, and so it feels like for many people that that amount that they pay to better investing should be allocated on a four person basis. Uh, and again, that goes against uh, our best practices and recommendation for the operation of an investment club. So if your club is in that situation and simply refuses to follow our recommendation, uh, then my suggestion is to keep it off the books entirely. Uh, have members write their check to Better Investing for their share of the owner of the Better Investing membership renewal. Uh, the treasurer collects all the members' checks and sends them all off in an envelope to Better Investing. And Better Investing is completely fine with processing 12 checks for a 12-person club. Uh, they are uh, ha have no problem at all doing that. So. Uh, uh, we, you know, that is your alternative. Uh, and then it doesn't show up in the books and then everyone will be satisfied, uh, except perhaps the treasurer whose job is slightly made more complicated by this decision of the club uh, to not follow um, this particular recommendation. Now, this leads us uh, to a very firmly worded um, uh, recommendation for clubs uh, who are determined, one, to collect fees and uh, uh, from, from, from members to cover expenses, and two, are uh, believe that they should be allocating those expenses equally. Now, can't stop you from doing it. However, this is a double whammy uh, that uh, it has unintended consequences uh, for uh, the partners in the partnership, especially uh, the uh, the partners who have uh, a, uh, the smaller interest in the club. Uh, when you collect, so you've got an expense and you're going to equally allocate that expense, and now you're going to collect a fee from every member to cover their expense. When you enter this in the books, the way that unit value accounting works, and you pay the expense, um, you're going to end up penalizing uh, the members with smaller capital accounts and reward the members with the larger accounts. So in the end, their unit values get, uh, or their, their, the number of units um, uh, get impacted because the expense reduces the value of the unit when you pay the expense out of the book. So uh, this, again, if you're a, the, the, a large owner in your club and you want to maximize the benefit to yourself at the, at the, at the detriment of the smaller, uh, those in your club who own smaller uh, percentage ownership, then you can, you can uh, suggest that you collect equal fees uh, to, and uh, enter the expenses uh, as a, an equally um, allocated expense. Uh, Russell, do you have any uh, clarity uh, to offer on my take on this particular situation? Yeah, I, I like to explain it. If you equally allocate an expense, and let's just assume that it comes to uh, the amounts equal to one, the value of one unit. And if I own 100 units, uh, the way that to, to equally allocate, you have to understand, the program will process a partial withdrawal and it has to do with IRS regulations that the economic consequences and the tax consequences are equal. And to do that, that's how it's done in the software. So if you have an expense that is equal to the value of one unit, if I own 100 units, I lose 1% of my holdings. If someone has 1,000 units, they use one-tenth of 1% of their holdings. So you can see how the people holding a lot fewer units get penalized by doing that. They lose a greater percentage of their units by that equal allocation. And it's definitely not in the uh, uh, the the best interests of those members. And you can if if you 
uh, if you're a treasurer and, and you really want to, um, to, to understand this, you can, you know, back up your data and you can try entering it out and you can see how the, uh, the, the ramifications of it. Uh, but otherwise, if you want to use equally allocated expenses, don't collect fees. Um, and that's, that's the bottom line. Um, and, uh, you know, we suggest not using equally allocated expenses or collecting fees uh, to cover expenses at all. So uh, if you follow those guidelines, you won't run into problems. Yeah, I just want to reiterate your warning about risky legal things. I recently actually looked up the tax law on this and it definitely says um, the partnership agreement is the controlling document, but if it's not addressed in the partnership agreement, that uh, expenses must be allocated at the same way that profits uh, are. So um, technically, if, if you're uh, allocating equally and not allocating your uh, profits equally, uh, you're technically in violation of the law. So um, be careful about that. Uh, let me just wrap it up with uh, um, a few comments on club expenses. Um, we understand that your uh, your clubs are going to incur expenses, and we understand that probably uh, between Better Investing and iClub Central, uh, we're going to be the, the the recipients of those expenses uh, for the services that we provide. But uh, keep in mind that expenses always reduce your returns. Uh, in your your investment club portfolio. So do your best to keep the expenses um, to a minimum. If you're a new club, uh, expenses are going to really adversely affect your returns. It's, it's almost impossible for new clubs for the first couple of years um, to become profitable uh, because expenses are going to be so high relative to uh, the amount that members are putting in. Now, over time, as the uh, paid-in uh, capital grows, as the portfolio grows, your expenses are not going to grow uh, as a percentage. They're pretty fixed, uh, so they're not going to grow at that nearly the same rate, and they're going to be a much smaller proportion of your overall portfolio. And so the impact of, the, of expenses is going to uh, fall off uh, as you go along. Um, the, other, the other final point is when, with respect to returns in your investment club, your investment club is an investment education vehicle. Uh, it's an important tool to help members learn how to invest, to give them experience uh, in investing. Uh, and so focusing on that aspect uh, can help you understand why it's important to incur um, certain expenses, to keep your club knowledgeable, uh, to keep your club, uh, keep your club uh, uh, always working towards the future and uh, educating your members uh, along the way. Uh, I, you know, and there's, there's, uh, there certainly are clubs that uh, invest in expensive subscriptions. Uh, usually these are more mature clubs that might subscribe to a newsletter or value line or some other service uh, to assist them in their investment decision making. Uh, again, there's nothing wrong with that as long as you can justify uh, the expense in some way, uh, either from the education premium that they provide or the financial results that you're able to generate uh, as a result of that particular subscription. Uh, so, Russell, I see a couple of questions here. Uh, that have come in. Uh, so let me uh, at, at run these by you, Bonnie. Uh, Bobby uh, asks, hi, Bonnie. Bobby, uh, are donations by the club to a charity an expense or a fee, and how does the IRS treat that? Okay, well, they're kind of neither. Uh, it's a charitable contribution. There is a special transaction in there for charitable contributions and both the online and desktop versions of the software. So use that. And when you do that, your tax preparation, the program will allocate that by ownership and there'll be a line on the K-1s for charitable contributions. And each member would have, that's their share of the club's contribution. They can claim that as a charitable contribution for their own personal tax returns. Yeah, that charitable amount will be on their K-1, and uh, 
um, you know, it would be a good idea to remind the, the clubs. We suggest, you know, we cover this in our Closing the Books webinar. I always uh, suggest that clubs uh, think about using uh, using that charitable contribution function uh, to assist them uh, in uh, their year-end planning. Um, some I've heard from clubs that make a donation to the library that provides a meeting space for them. Uh, I've heard of clubs that are formed by members of a particular church. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I suggest that those clubs consider ways of tithing uh, through their investment club uh, by donating um, securities to the club, the members would receive a benefit uh, that goes beyond the actual cash value. Uh, and again, that can help them to, um, to perhaps make a larger contribution. So there are benefits uh, to the individual and to the investment. Um, the charitable donation would reduce um, uh, the number of units uh, or would reduce, reduce the unit value, Russell? Uh, yeah, it'll probably reduce the unit value. Oh no, yeah. it's actually it it it's uh, you know I haven't done that. <laughs> I, I haven't gone and checked it. The one thing I did want to reiterate because I didn't mention is uh, this charitable contribution transaction does allow you to um, donate securities, not just cash. So that's a important difference. That uh, it makes it a little nicer. Yeah, yeah. That, way, that that you can. You get you Go get ahead. the benefit of appreciation and you get a bigger deduction because of the depreciation. Right. So it's better to donate appreciated ones. Exactly. Yeah, for uh, uh, for from a portfolio management perspective, uh, if you've, you're a club and you're sitting on uh, a stock that's appreciated greatly in value um, and you don't want to sell it because of capital gains, but you would like to thin out the position and you're considering making a charitable gift anyway, uh, it can be really smart to gift shares of that appreciated security. You get the full, um, uh, you get the, the taxable deduction of the full amount uh, that's distributed then to the partners uh, and the capital gains uh, go away. Uh, the basis gets stepped up uh, when you make the gift. So uh, you can accomplish some, some positive uh, objectives. Um, you're making a gift that cost you much less uh, than the benefit that you receive. You're helping out the portfolio by improving diversification. Uh, you're reducing risk by selling a stock that may be potentially um, significantly overvalued. Uh, so it really uh, can be a great tool uh, that I don't think a lot of clubs take advantage of. Uh, Russell, uh, there was a question about the accounting software. Uh, if we automatically allocate expenses according to ownership. Uh, that's the default setting, uh, so just don't change the default. That's my opinion. I <laughs> go with Doug, um, yeah. but you can change it. And it, actually, you can. There's a little, um, I think it's a, a checkbox or things for each transaction, so you don't have to do it globally. Uh, you can do it for each individual transaction expense. And it's in yeah. the that choice is in the expense transaction. Yeah, I believe that uh, the default is by percentage ownership because that's the recommendation. So in order to use the non-recommended method, you actually have to do something specific when you're entering that transaction. Uh, and then uh, finally, Lori asks if the club used to allocate equally, do we have to go back? Uh, to correct the mistake. Um, yeah, I was just answering that. I, I, I wouldn't go back. Uh, yeah. You might have to file amended tax returns. And so it might be multiple years of amended tax returns. Yeah. I would just, if you're going to go back, just go back to the start of the current tax year and do all of them for the current tax year forward. Yeah, uh, that's what I would do as well. Uh, I would make sure Again, make sure that your club members are aware of this and that uh, if this is a change in policy, they should agree on it. Uh, but um, uh, you can feel free to share our, our presentation tonight and our guidance uh, on this particular topic uh, as they uh, are de deliberating uh, the decision about, uh, about how, how these expenses and fees should be handled. 
Well, uh, I think that wraps us up for tonight. So we're going to call it uh, call it uh, right now. Thank you, Russell, for helping us out. Thank you, Sean, uh, in the back office for helping. And thanks to all of you Investment Club members for turning out to our webinar tonight. It was great to see so many of you at the Better Investing Convention in Chicago uh, this past weekend. Uh, it was a terrific event. Uh, it was the uh, best attended Better Investing National Conference in something like eight years. So uh, there were full rooms, full classrooms, and a full house uh, throughout. Uh, so, uh, and as always, just top notch education. Uh, and I was pleased to be a part of it. I believe it was my 24th Better Investing National Conference uh, going back to 1995. I've uh, been to all but one, I believe. So, uh, uh, and this was uh, just another terrific event. Uh, so thanks again to all of you. We'll look forward to seeing you at our next Investment Club webinar.